Well, just this past Sunday, uh, Reverend Schof offered up for our consideration um, the beginnings, the beginnings of the early church, the ways in which the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ began something nearly 2,000 years ago, and, and, and how this thing is, is still beginning. As, as I've mentioned before, Jesus' early followers, they weren't expecting resurrection. And so now, here this, this group of people was, was faced with, faced with, with asking, what, what does this mean? What does this mean for us, and how do we live in response to that? And this week, I've been turning over Reverend Schof's words. She said, we are listening in. When we read Scripture, we are listening in to a, to a nascent new beginning, a new beginning that is rising out of what was. It's a reminder to us that these Scriptures that we have, particularly these, these epistles that we find in the New Testament, are a, are a gift to us as they provide insight, a, a window into the thoughts of these early followers as they wrestled with just that. What does this resurrection, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ mean? And so I invite you to open up your, your Bibles that you've brought with you from home, your pew Bibles, as we look at one of the epistles this morning. It comes from 1 John. 1 John chapter 3. And we'll begin at verse 16. And before I jump in there, I just want to say I, I hope that you will, you will be here next Sunday and remember to invite a friend as our director of youth and college ministry who's in seminary currently at Duke Divinity School, Chandler Gelb, uh, will be here in the pulpit next Sunday and she'll be preaching also um, from 1 John and you're not going to want to miss it. <laughs> That's exactly right. So friends, let's begin right here at verse 16. We know love by this, that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but, but in truth and action. And, and by this, we will know that, that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts, and God knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God, and we receive from him whatever we ask, because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that, that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them, and by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit that he has given us. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Now, I've shared this story with, with some of you before, but... You know, one of the more challenging courses that I remember from high school was Mr. Gullah's AP Calculus class. Um, incidentally, as, as is the case often when faced with something really challenging, this became one of my favorite classes at Hollywood Hills High School. And he was one of the best teachers that, that I have ever had the privilege of having. Mr. Gullah had a way of, of, of bringing to life and explaining these, these complex calculus principles in creative and engaging ways. But it was hard. It was hard work, and, and the students in that class were, were driven. They were motivated students. We were motivated students. We were concerned with, with getting good grades. What ended up on the report card, it mattered to us. And so I can remember this one particular day where, where Mr. Gullah was, was doing a review for an exam that we had coming up the following week, and and all of us were, were paying close attention, as you do, hoping to, to glean something more about what might be on the exam. And 
Mr. Gullah had just spent a, a considerable chunk of his lecture time explaining the, the proof of, of some mathematical concept and seeking to give us the context for, for some principle that we were learning when, when a student raised his hand and asked what I believe most of us were thinking, which was, is this going to be on the exam? <laughs> well, I can remember Mr. Gullah just sort of staring blankly um, back at us as, as if to say, is that really all you care about? I'm trying to show you something, something deeper here, the, the underlying principles which will allow you to better understand how all of this fits together. Were grades all that we cared about? This grade-oriented approach was, in fact, closing us off to, to a deeper understanding. After all, the, the grade on the exam, it's supposed to serve as, as evidence of this understanding, right? But, but the grade, the grade is, is, is not the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal was, or was supposed to be, in this case, understanding calculus. And what Mr. Gullah wanted us to see was that the grade was secondary to, to understanding. What he wanted for us and what he hoped for us was, was far deeper than a good grade at the end of the day. He hoped to impart to us knowledge that would serve as, as foundational building blocks for our continued scholastic journeys. In, in one of the small groups that I'm currently participating in here as a part of our church, uh, the conversation frequently turns toward assurance of salvation. How can we be assured of our salvation? How can we know that we are saved? How can we know that, that we'll go to heaven? And I, and I think there's a real temptation to approach faith like approaching that class, simply trying to, to get a good grade as if that were the point, this, this focus on, on what happens at the end. And, and that's not unique to this particular small group. In, in fact, it's, it's a conversation that you find regularly in, in our brand of, of Christianity. In the Western world, North American Christianity, there is sort of this hyper-focus on individual salvation, as if that were the point of it all. British theologian N.T. Wright, in his book, Surprised by Hope, um, he touches on this approach, and he suggests this. He suggests that, that, that Scripture is pretty clear that God is going to redeem and renew creation. God is seeking to redeem and renew creation through human beings, through you and, and, and through me, and rescue those human beings as a part of the process, but not as the point of it all. In other words, our salvation is not the central act of God's activity. God is seeking to redeem and renew all of it, and God is seeking to use you to do it. To, to use you and you and me to do it. Saving us as a part of the process, but not as the point of it all. Our scripture for today, it, it really seeks, I think, to highlight that human salvation is not the point of it all. The writer seems to, to want to ask, what if in our journeys of faith we are called to something far deeper, to participate in something far richer? The writer, I think, of 1 John is concerned with, with how our faith and our belief in God, how they're related to the ways that we do or don't love the world. Hear that again. The writer of 1 John is concerned with how our faith and belief in God, how, how they're related to the ways that we do or don't love others in the world. And the writer here is really clear that love 
is an action. Verse 18, he says, Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but, but in truth and action. Well, what the writer seems to be communicating here is that the relationship works in both directions. That is, what we believe about God and who God has created us to be ought to have an effect on how we interact with the world. What we believe about God and who God has created us to be ought to impact how we relate to the world. But also that the way we interact with the world, the way we treat one another, the way we love one another, or the ways that we don't love one another will also have an effect on our faith and belief. The relationship works in both directions. I had another professor, this one in seminary, um, named Dr. Collier, Dr. Emil, El Elmer Collier was my professor for church doctrine. And so, actually, before I, I, I dive into that class, he would want me to say this. I don't want you to hear me say this morning that our salvation is irrespective of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our relationship with God begins with God's activity in the world and what was accomplished in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's critical. In fact, I was listening to a, to a podcast just uh, recently, and this psychiatrist who, who writes about um, habit and cravings and how to break things like uh, substance abuse and, and addiction to cigarettes, he, he says this, he says, when we try and just rely on our own self-control, what can happen is we, we stop the behavior for a short time. And so we give up cigarettes for a week or two weeks, or, or we stop eating in ways we know we shouldn't for a week or two or three months, and then at some point, we give in. The dam breaks, so to speak, and, and we have that cigarette, or we, or we eat that thing we know we shouldn't eat, and then we do it again, and we feel guilt, and then we feel shame, and then we do it again, and it becomes something that feeds itself. What God accomplishes for us in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is breaks the pattern of shame and guilt. It frees us to be able to love in the ways that we are called to love. And so that's kind of where I want to focus today. But back to my doctrine professor, who would be grateful I said all those things. The seminary program that I was a part of was a distance education program, and so I spent about one month out of every school year on campus, and the rest of it um, was done online. We, we watched lectures, we participated in, in group discussions via an online forum, and, and then of course our exams were, for the most part, unproctored. And so different professors dealt with that in different ways. Some of them just offered all of our exams open book. You could use whatever resources you, you wanted, and they found ways to test for what they wanted us to understand. But Dr. Collier's class was different. We, we did not have open book and open resource exams. They were, they were closed book. And, and the thing I remember most about his class, in fact, is doesn't come from the lecture. It, it comes from his policy on cheating. Unlike some professors who, who might have, have given us a, 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 a talk about how cheating, if we cheat, we'll, um, we might be kicked out of school or other disciplinary action, or how if we cheat, we're not going to learn what we are supposed to learn, Dr. Collier said, listen, when you take the exam, don't open the book for fear that you will do damage to your soul. He didn't say it waving a finger. He didn't say it accusatorily. He said it with a deep and profound concern for the damage we might do to ourselves when acting without integrity. 
What Dr. Collier was, was tapping into is, is exactly what the writer here in 1 John is, is tapping into, is that the way that we behave in the world, the things that we choose to do or, or don't do, have a deep and profound effect on our heart and on our soul. In verse 17, the writer here says, how does God, How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's good and and sees a brother or sister in need and, and yet refuses to help? Today's passage is clear that that we are at odds with God's love within us when we fail to act. It's why perhaps you experience this. I know that I do when I'm driving around our city and I see people who are clearly in need. I am at conflict with myself. I come up with all kinds of good reasons why I don't need to act in this case. I'm good at coming up with those justifications and excuses. And let me say, love sometimes looks like no. It doesn't mean yes all the time. But it is why there is that struggle within us because God has placed that love for your neighbor deep within you. This idea of abiding is is used frequently in the Gospel of John and throughout the Johannine epistles. And abiding has everything to do with, with aligning our hearts with the heart of God. We can always come up with reasons not to love each other. Oliver Berkman, in his book, um, 10,000 Weeks, He discusses um, the challenge of dating in a section entitled, The Inevitability of Settling. And in that section, he talks about how how people will avoid relationship because they they don't want to settle. They they get into a relationship, and, and after some time, as soon as it seems to look like things are getting a little bit serious, they begin finding the flaws in the other person, and they say to themselves, well, I don't want to settle, so this must not be it. And he says that sometimes that may be the case, that because some people do make spectacularly bad choices in love. But he says more often, more often the real problem is this. And these are his words. He says, the real problem is just that the other person is one other person. In other words, the, the cause of your difficulties isn't that your partner is especially flawed or, or that the two of you are especially incompatible, but that you're finally noticing all the ways in which your partner is inevitably finite and thus deeply disappointing by comparison with the world of your fantasy, where the limiting rules of reality don't apply. And friends, this isn't just in our romantic relationships. We find all kinds of reasons not to love one another. First John calls us to set aside our reasons for not loving those God has placed before us, not simply because it will make the world better, but because in loving others, it makes us better. And so what could it look like if if we gave ourselves over one to the other? Right here in this community. You know, what Mr. Gullah wanted us to see was that if we truly sought to understand, if we were able to, to finally put the pieces of these mathematical concepts together, then passing the exam, that was a given. Of course, he wanted us to pass the exam, but that was not his ultimate goal for us. It was far deeper. And what the writer of 1 John wants us to see is that if we will give ourselves over to loving one another, to caring deeply for one another, utilizing our resources for that purpose, then salvation, salvation naturally takes care of itself 
because of what God has done in Jesus Christ and because of our deep and abiding presence with God and God with us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.